March 2025, somewhere over Iraq. A C-130J had just completed another supply mission, flying troops and equipment between coalition bases. The aircraft was built less than 10 years ago, but the design it's based on is 71 years old. In a world of stealth jets and drones, the U.S. Air Force is still choosing to send this plane, the same one that first flew in 1954. Other aircraft that were meant to replace it, like the C-141 or even the C-17, are long retired or flying in smaller numbers. One pilot summed it up best. It's old, but it works. Every single time. So how did a transport built for the Cold War survive seven decades of change, outlasting wars, trends, and even its competitors? To find out, we have to go back to the beginning, when the C-130 almost didn't make it past the drawing board. It started in 1951, during the last years of the Korean War. The U.S. Air Force had a problem. Its main transport planes, the C-119 flying boxcar and C-47 Skytrain, were slow, underpowered, and couldn't carry enough weight for the growing demands of the Cold War. So in February 1951, the Air Force sent out a request, a new medium transport that could haul heavy loads into short, rough airstrips and get back out again. Over a dozen aircraft manufacturers submitted designs. The favorites were Boeing, Douglas, and Fairchild, all giants of the time. But one smaller company, Lockheed Aircraft Corporation, quietly entered the race with a proposal called Model 82. Inside Lockheed's Burbank office, engineers Kelly Johnson, Gene Frost, and Roy Wimmer began shaping something unconventional. Instead of the typical piston engines, they chose turboprops, a new type of engine that combined jet power with propeller efficiency. They added a rear-loading ramp so vehicles and pallets could roll straight in, and they gave the plane sturdy landing gear, capable of handling dirt, gravel, or ice. The prototype, later named the YC-130, first flew on August 23, 1954, from Burbank, California. The flight lasted just 61 minutes, and when it landed, Lockheed test pilot Stan Belts turned to the engineers and said, this thing will go places. He was right. But the Hercules wasn't built for comfort or prestige, it was built for chaos. And it wouldn't take long to find it. Because when the C-130 arrived in Vietnam, it became more than a transport, it became a lifeline. By the time the U.S. entered Vietnam, the C-130 had already proven itself in smaller conflicts and humanitarian missions, but nothing compared to what came next. In Southeast Asia, it was keeping entire bases alive. The Hercules flew food, ammunition, and medical supplies into airstrips that barely existed, places like Khe Sanh, Dak To, and Pleiku. Pilots called them dirt roads with a control tower. The plane's tough frame and powerful Allison T-56 engines let it land where no other four-engine aircraft could. Crews often flew low and slow through valleys under enemy fire, relying on sheer skill and the C-130's durability to survive. During Operation Junction City in 1967, the C-130 performed one of its most daring missions, dropping thousands of paratroopers deep behind enemy lines. Later that same year, engineers at Lockheed Marietta and Air Force specialists developed a new system, the Low Altitude Parachute Extraction System. It allowed the C-130 to drop heavy cargo at treetop level without landing, using a parachute to yank loads straight out the back ramp. It worked, and it saved lives. But Vietnam also sparked an entirely new idea one that would transform the Hercules from a cargo hauler into something no one expected, a weapon. It started as an experiment in 1966 at Eglund Air Force Base, Florida. The U.S. was looking for a way to provide constant air support at night, something that could circle a battlefield and rain accurate fire without needing to dive or make passes like a fighter jet. One group of Air Force engineers and Lockheed technicians decided to try something unconventional mount side-firing weapons on a C-130 Hercules. The idea came from Captain Ron Terry, an Air Force officer who had tested the concept earlier on smaller planes like the AC-47 Spooky. Lockheed's engineers stripped down a standard C-130, added gun mounts along the left side, and installed sensors and radar systems that could track targets in the dark. 
when the prototype, designated the AC-130A Spectre, took off in September 1967, no one was sure if it would work. It did more than work. Flying over Laos and South Vietnam, the Spectre circled high above enemy supply routes and destroyed truck convoys with devastating precision. Crews used a combination of 20mm Vulcan cannons, 40mm Bofars guns, and later a 105mm howitzer, the largest weapon ever carried on a plane. By the early 1970s, the AC-130 had become the most feared aircraft of the war. It could stay in the air for hours, see in the dark, and hit targets with near-perfect accuracy. When Vietnam ended, most aircraft from that era were retired. The Spectre wasn't. It flew again in Panama in 1989 during Operation Just Cause, then in Desert Storm in 1991, taking out Iraqi radar and convoys at night. It returned over Iraq and Afghanistan in the 2000s, this time upgraded as the AC-130U Spooky II and later the AC-130J Ghost Rider, fitted with modern sensors and precision-guided munitions. Even now, more than 50 years after its first combat mission, the Ghost Rider remains a key weapon in U.S. operations. What began as a cargo plane had become a flying fortress, one that has never missed a war since the day it was born. But while one Hercules was fighting wars, another was saving lives. In August 2005, when Hurricane Katrina hit the U.S. Gulf Coast, entire cities were underwater. The first aircraft to land at the flooded New Orleans International Airport wasn't a passenger jet. It was a C-130 Hercules from the Air National Guard, bringing supplies, rescue teams, and generators. Just five years later, in January 2010, when a massive earthquake struck Haiti, the Hercules once again became the first sign of help. Runways were cracked and debris filled, but the C-130 could land where nothing else could. Over the following weeks, it flew thousands of tons of relief cargo and evacuated the injured. Then there were the Hurricane Hunters, air crews from the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron. Since the 1970s, they've flown directly into hurricanes using modified C-130s called WC-130s, collecting data that satellites can't. It's one of the few jobs where flying straight into a storm isn't an accident. It's the mission. Many of the people flying them today are second-generation pilots and engineers. One Air Force Reserve pilot told a reporter in 2019, My dad flew this same model 30 years ago. The smell of hydraulic fluid and jet fuel hasn't changed. That's because the aircraft hasn't needed to. By the late 1980s, the Hercules had already proven itself in every role imaginable. Transport, gunship, rescue, even weather reconnaissance. But it was showing its age. The analog gauges, older Allison engines, and mechanical flight systems were designed in a world before GPS, before computers, before stealth aircraft. So, in 1991, Lockheed began working on a new generation, the C-130J Super Hercules. It wasn't a clean sheet design, but an evolution. The team kept what worked and rebuilt everything else. The J model introduced digital flight controls, glass cockpits, composite propellers, and more efficient Rolls-Royce AE2100 D3 turboprops. Each engine produced over 4,600 horsepower, giving the aircraft shorter takeoff runs and longer range. It could fly faster, higher, and farther while burning less fuel than its predecessors. The first C-130J took flight in April 1996, and deliveries began to air forces around the world soon after. What Lockheed didn't expect was how much demand would come from outside the United States. Today, more than 70 countries operate variants of the Hercules, from Canada and Australia to India, Norway, and Japan. Each uses it differently. Some fight wildfires with massive water tanks attached inside the fuselage, Others drop supplies to research stations in Antarctica. In Italy, the C-130J ferries troops across the Mediterranean, and India, it delivers disaster relief to remote Himalayan villages, where even helicopters struggle. The adaptability of the Hercules turned it into something larger than an airplane. It became a platform.
one that could be rewired, refitted, and reimagined for any mission on Earth. Even Lockheed engineers started calling it a flying ecosystem. New variants, like the MC-130J Commando II, specialize in covert operations. The KC-130J refuels fighters midair, and the HC-130J Combat King II performs long-range search and rescue. Through 70 decades, the Hercules evolved without ever losing its identity. It's not the prettiest or the fastest aircraft in the world, but that's not what it was built for. But perhaps the biggest secret to its survival isn't in its metal or its missions. It's in what the C-130 represents.